Hello, my name is Filiberto Amati, and I'm a partner at Amati and Associates in Warsaw. And we are here today for uh, the second of our episodes on the future of design and design thinking. I welcome Marco Bevolo, uh, my co-author and partner in this research, who's going to introduce our esteemed guest of today. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, uh, Filiberto. Uh, today we are uh, very pleased and honored to have uh, Pernilla Johansson. Uh, from uh, uh, Sweden, uh, who is uh, uh, definitely a design leader uh, and is definitely a design thinker with a very wide uh, uh, and deep uh, experience uh, in Europe uh, and in the Far East uh, in global companies uh, like uh, Philips and Electrolux, where she has been a chief design uh, officer and uh, in various uh, leadership positions uh, before. Uh, Pernilla, would you like to uh, just uh, sketch uh, your very, very uh, dense experience in a few uh, sentences, highlights uh, for uh, our viewers? Yeah, I, I mean, I normally say uh, 26 years of, uh, of design leadership uh, across two multinational companies uh, across five countries. Um, I, uh, I started in Europe and then I took, um, I bounced over to the US where I was part of a joint venture with Philips. And um, that came to an end. One of those really good learnings where businesses are not really managing to find a common culture. And then uh, I uh, took on, a, on an assignment in, uh, in Singapore. And that's, uh, that became 16 years. And uh, that's where I transi transitioned from, from Philips to, uh, to Electrolux and, and built the uh, design department uh, in Singapore for Electrolux. And uh, after six years doing that, stabilizing, I was offered to go back to Sweden for 360 journey uh, 23 years later. And uh, then uh, I headed the uh, small appliance um, design department uh, that was global. We saw we were uh, globally uh, uh, creating products for for um, um, yeah all the all the small products that was not having big, big installations basically, and um, then three years ago, uh, three and a half years ago, I uh, I took on the um, CDO function and uh, leading the uh, the design function for Electrolux, and uh, that. Um, Ended uh, end of the last year. Um, in in I shifted into um, my next uh, role in uh, designing life and designing what uh, I will do with my next third wave of my career. So uh, I'm in a very interesting space at the moment. Thank you, thank you uh, very much. And it's uh, I think uh, the three of us have experienced a very postmodern uh, professional. Uh, uh, patterns um, in terms of uh, the ability to uh, adapt, change uh, to different uh, cultural contexts, uh, uh, to different uh, organizational cultures, and uh, culture uh, will definitely come back in our uh, exchange and discussion uh, today. But the first question uh, for me is uh, taking a step back because we are uh, trying to sketch uh, together with uh, uh, Filiberto and together with our contributors the future of design thinking and design leadership. And I would like to start from the past or better from the definition of what you think is uh, design thinking and design and uh, perhaps also with the motivation as a Scandinavian uh, designer uh, uh, to get into design at the origin of your journey. So what attracted you? Yeah, should I start with the beginning or the end? Of the <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you are uh, totally free to choose. And of course, Filiberto might jump in with uh, follow-up questions anytime. Yeah, so. well, maybe I start with the last part of the question, you know, yeah. what got me into design. I, I um, I studied uh, mechanical engineering during my, we call it gymnasium, which is kind of like high school, I guess, in international uh, timeframes. And um, I fell in love with the uh, blueprint drawings with the ink. Uh, and I remember making all these 
uh, views of, of, uh, of uh, mechanical parts. Um, and uh, in, in parallel to that, just deciding on what I would do next, you know, where would life bring me? I was uh, painting a lot at, uh, at home. And uh, then a friend of mine told me that there was this preliminary artistic education. And I thought, why not take another year just doing art um, before I decide what I will be when I grow up? And um, so I did that. And then they had a course called design. And that was the first time I heard about it. And I discovered that there was this fabulous school in my hometown called um, Kunstindustri at that time, HDK, the High School for Design and Craft in, in, at the University of Gothenburg. And um, it was really few classes, very few students, um, hard to get in. And I said, you know what, it's not gonna happen. And then I had a friend who said, you know, you have to apply. And it bugged me so much that I, in the end said, okay, I will apply just to prove to you that I'm not gonna get in. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did, and I went through, you know, the first selection of uh, from 700 apl applicants to 150. And then um, we had to go to school to work for four days and doing samples. And it was the toughest week that I had experienced, but I loved it. And then I got the positive result that I actually did get in. So I'm for great, <laughs> forever grateful for that friend who challenged me and actually made me um, take that path because I never looked back. Um, and so that's the kind of like the background of how I fell into it. And that was industrial design. I mean, today when we talk design, I think it's become so complex that we actually need to talk in more clarifying terms sometimes. And I think that leads as well to, you know, what is design and, and what is design thinking? Because I think the beauty of things is that they are constantly evolving. They mean different things in different time spans and different contexts. And the definition is, is, is important. Design as a, as a word is um, one that has become extremely confusing. Uh, my favorite sentence is designers, designs, well-designed design. And there is nothing grammatically wrong uh, in putting the word design in any of those parts of the sentence. So in a way, what design is, I guess, is more of a reflection on what the person using the word means, right? And that's why I try sometimes to be quite sparse in the way I use it. I try to fill with other words uh, so that I'm not diluting its actual meaning. What I do like uh, is that by design is um, not disputed. By design is intentional change. Something is always um, changing and something is always intentional. That's what kind of like sets design apart. So to me, that's, um, that's how I like to, uh, to frame design as a, as a, um, as a uh, definition, uh, so to say. And then when it comes to, when it's applied in a strategic way, so we're really going deep and we apply strategic processes and methodologies, I would say that it is synonymous with innovation. And it's another confusing uh, um, definition in what is innovation and what is design. And then if, it, if design is defined more tactically, it is more about differentiation. It's about differentiating itself from something else. Saying that, I believe that actually design has over the last decades had such an enormous power of value, like a business value. And it is the outcome of design, the noun of design that is then being referred to. But as designers, we know that if we're gonna have that fabulous output, we know that we need a really great process. We need to go through that methodology to make sure that we are getting it right in the end. So for us designers, we speak more about the how, while maybe 
our business partners speak more about the what. And then we have a language conundrum, which is sometimes doing, uh, making us talk uh, cross, uh, I would say. But in, in essence, I believe that design is very much of a cognitive skill that everyone can learn. And it, it does take a lot of practice to become an elite player. You know, you have, you have, uh, you know, you have the ability to create whoever you are, right? And, yeah. uh, and it's like singing or sports. Everyone can sing, everyone can play football, but everyone cannot do it professionally. So, well, not not everyone is Ibrahimovic uh, to to remain no, in Sweden. Precisely. I think precisely. your uh, definition of design is quite close to some uh, remarkable authors I have here, uh, like Tony Fry. Okay. Uh, is design as politics, uh, and uh, I have here uh, uh, Victor Papanek, uh, which is uh, a historical reference, uh, and I have here, but I cannot find uh, uh, Willem Flusser. So it's a very encompassing definition of design. But I would like to involve uh, Filiberto from a specific uh, cultural angle, because you have worked in Singapore, in the States, in the Netherlands, uh, in, in Sweden, in Scandinavia, uh, uh, but actually, you came to this profession through serendipity. If mm -hmm. your friend didn't uh, annoy you uh, in a sort of uh, tension, uh, you would have chosen a different path, and uh, I'm sure you have, would have been equally uh, successful. Uh, with Filiberto, we spoke about serendipity. Uh, in the context of the future of events, uh, and we spoke a lot about it. Um, and you also now work and think about uh, the design of, uh, of cultures. I would like Filiberto to, to introduce and to shoot a question about this relationship between design culture and serendipity from the points of view we exchange several times also as fellow Italians. Yeah, so, uh, and I would say that, and Linking back to what uh, Pernille just said, you know, you, the designer, not by design in, in this case, um, the, uh, you spoke about design as the process of creation. I'm not a designer and I look at it from a business point of view. And I think that one of the biggest, probably there are two trends that in business have really helped transformation. One is the, uh, the part of open innovation, uh, which has to do with uh, uh, innovators and accelerators, because companies have realized that if they try to do those business internally, they would have killed them in a stage gate approach, probably. So they put them, you know, far enough from the core, but at an arm's length, uh, to be able then to transform themselves through that. But the true part <clears throat> of uh, transformation in many large corporations in the past 10 years has been by elevating the design function and the designers within the organization in terms of uh, stretching the boundaries, uh, uh, in, in terms of bringing creativity, promoting design thinking as such. So, How do you as a designer, before we talk about serendipity, how do you as a designer see your role within the organization and design leader, of course, within the organization in terms of reshaping the organization from inside and changing and, and making sure that the organization is fit in terms of sustainability, in terms of human-centric and now ecosystem-centric uh, in terms of uh, uh, friendliness, in terms of culture and so on and so forth? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it all depends on where, what the company it is, what the company context is, and, and where they stand on the maturity of this, I, I, and, and where their ambition is and what the gap is, right? So all those things matters. I think in general, most large companies have realized that they need to work in what I would almost call an ambidextrous organizational setup. So you have both the need to perform in working with the current business and making that 
better and better. And very often there is a natural machinery of incremental innovation going on there. And at the same time, you need to also experiment and expand in new business opportunities between the product category gaps, uh, uh, with new business models, et cetera, et cetera. And you need to, on, on the other hand, uh, do um, a business-oriented assessment of what these opportunities are, the size of them, from a, like an analytical and, and, and business-oriented thinking. And then in parallel to that, constantly work with the design-oriented thinking of experimenting and exploring and, and seeing where these um, experiences, ideas and, and innovation are taking us. So very often, I think if you think about innovation is, is bringing into the new, is sort of like, what is the new? But design is bringing into being. And, and the two are almost like cogwheels that has to work together. So how, how do you, I mean, if that's the framing and that's the ambition, it's, a, it's a kind of like a, a multidimensional uh, aspect, then you do need to have um, people focusing on their different parts. I mean, I think you have to have people focusing on your core business and you have to have people focusing on being in that new and, and, and driving that. And eventually when it's matured, it, it will go into the core business. And then you need to have, especially um, in the explorative part where innovation is happening, you will need to work with design thinking and design thinking methodologies. And I mean, we never got to the point of really defining um, design thinking, but, but I would say design thinking is the inclusive part of design. It is where we can collaborate. And if you put design thinking in the middle of, and you're making that your collaboration system, you can all unite around what your goal is in terms of addressing that human or that system or that life experience that you are aiming to achieve. So I, I think you have to work on, on all levels. As a, as a design leader, you have to work on building your own business acumen as well as your peers and the company's design acumen. I think there is such a beautiful way of learning from one another and bringing the different sciences together in something that is more wholesome. And then you have to empower the teams and really making those work autonomously and, and, and finding the strength in the outside in perspective and the decision making and may, therefore be able to be faster. So I believe, you know, in the in the past, organizations had this man managerial command based, right? But we don't have time for that anymore. So the leader's role is very much about empowering those teams and making sure that they are sort of seeing the connection that's needed to be doing a really, really good job. And then, of course, in, on an individual level, that they are um, grown and that they are nurtured and that they are supported and that they are um, growing up in a culture and a climate which is um, uh, inducive for creativity and where they can actually learn. And I believe that when you are in that environment, you, you will actually blur the lines between designers and we will have much more cross fertilization of, of uh, people. And I think that will make the world a better place. Well, Absolutely. thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. I. I uh... I think, uh, again, uh, the, the work of Tony Fry and his uh, adoption of Heidegger and the, the fact that design is about design is, uh, is very much resonating in your... Uh, you uh, need to give me a reading list. Of, mm, you, you really... I, I, I believe you will have uh, more productive and entertaining uh, opportunities than my reading list, but, uh, <laughs> but I will... You know, if I may, he, he doesn't do this type of interviews next to a bookshelf, uh, you know, randomly. Yeah. It's because yeah. he needs to take books every once in a yeah, while. Yeah, to, to be reminded of... <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> no, the, 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 I wanted to introduce the dimension or the, 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 the angle of the future. You mentioned you come from industrial design. Mm -hmm. I myself uh, studied in, in electronics uh, design and engineering at high school, so I, I have a parallel uh, uh, past uh, as you have. Um, 
I started working in automotive design, but in the project management of prototypes. And only after several months I was working and, you know, we, we had a kind of garage atelier with a very competent uh, craftsman working with metal sheets and with uh, car parts to assemble prototypes. Um, after uh, several months, uh, a design director came uh, into, uh, into the, the, the garage and he looked at a prototype and he looked uh, very artisty. Uh, uh, and then he said, no, this doesn't go, th this doesn't work. And then the, the, the head of, um, of prototypes asked him why, because it's not beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I was really astonished because it was a kind of uh, uh, surprise uh, in the automotive uh, manufacturing culture and prototyping uh, concerns for engineering standards and so on to hear somebody saying uh, it's not beautiful. So uh, I think that's where we come from. We uh, are already very far away from where we started uh, 30 years ago. But the, the question is where we are going and on the basis of which drivers. I actually, I deeply believe in the power of cosmogonies, uh, philosophies, uh, ideologies to shape the future. Um, there is the power on which uh, Filiberto is much more knowledgeable of uh, digitalization, uh, uh, technological advancement, uh, uh, road mapping uh, based on scientific discovery. So um, where, uh, where do you see the driver for the next evolution of design uh, to, uh, to be found? Where would you look for? Uh, for such a principle organizing the future? I, I, uh, I see a couple of driver, drivers. Um, the most obvious one is of course technology. Um, and I know that you guys have been talking about uh, artificial intelligence in other, in other sessions. Um, I like to speak about it as augmented intelligence. I don't like artificial intelligence. I like augmented intelligence because I do believe that this technology, um, this advanced technology, this intelligent technology has the potential to augment themselves and make us humans better. And I, I think to deep dive into that one a little bit, I, I think it has potentially, the potential to actually lift today's most important questions of how we do things to why we do things. Because suddenly the how is not gonna be so difficult anymore. And I mean, if we're gonna live in a more sustainable world, we have to really be very, very cautious of what we're putting out there and the whole value chain and the entire life cycle. And it's complex. It's, it's, co it's beyond what we have been able to do before. So if we can actually use technology in getting us that data and spend our time on the really defining on what we should be putting out there rather than you know the, how we should put out it there and, and, and uh, guarantee a higher level of success rate. Um, I think that uh, that would be a very good thing and very optimistic thing. Mm -hmm. I think another thing which is extremely important as another dimension to this is the neuroscience learning that's happening now. I mean, we're getting into the brain and the way the brain function and the way humans are functioning to a level where we can probably start more effectively design mm -hmm. for behavioral change. And because if we're gonna to go towards a more sustainable world, that is one of the things that we have to learn as well, right? We have to also uh, learn to adopt and change and, and drive positively forward, right? So the neuroscience is super important component in, in behavioral design and, and the shaping of the future that we want. And then I think there's um, a third one. I have four, by the way. I think the third one is um, mindfulness. Um, mm. I think empathy is not good enough anymore. Empathy is a journey. You realizing empathy. You cannot just say that you have empathy because it actually doesn't mean anything. And, and I believe that mindfulness can potentially give us the power to unbiasedly really look at something and maybe bring us closer to the state of compassion and actually bring more meaningfulness to what we are doing. And then there is the fourth 
dimension, which I call expansion of uh, design. I, I, I kind of like trying to walk away from this whole democratization of it, because I feel that democratization is almost talking about losing value, right? It is, it is about an expansion of design. And I think there is a, I mean, there's science already now that, you know, there's not a business person that literally goes through school without knowing and learning about design. Um, designers who learns about, you know, other science as well. And sometimes we're a bit naive as well, because we actually, we only live in our own world and we're reading about the latest and greatest within design. And then we borrow from all kinds of other areas. And then we think it's design. And then other industries are doing exactly the same. And when we, if we would step out of ourselves and actually uh, empathize with our marketing colleagues and our, you know, business colleagues, we would learn that they are also expanding in a similar way. So if we can actually start bringing our different angles together in something that is a little bit more holistic and, and life centric, I think we have a beautiful future to look at in design. Well, thank you for also the kind of uh, systematic analysis of uh, the possibilities and the, and the opportunities. Uh, with I, yeah, the, yes. I wanted exactly. I wanted uh, to uh, to have a Filiberto coming with his uh, point of view. Because I mean, what you described, and I agree with Marco, it's uh, very well structured. It's uh, you know, uh, it's almost a convergence phenomenon where basically trends which are uh, independent are coming together and uh, they are shaping uh, a new form of design, a new emergent uh, discipline of design, which is uh, you know, on one end stronger on one end more strategic which is leveraging technology but it's truly based on uh, mindfulness uh, and empathy but for that to happen don't you think we still lack uh, a lingua franca a common shared uh, because when multidisciplinary come together there must be a way for them to communicate for them to understand each other without spending you know by the way that's why i did business school i have an mba and i have a dba and in business school now you're learning about design for you know and the minimum you need to take out of design in business school is to be able to talk to a designer <laughs> that's, it's not that they're teaching you exactly that's not that they're teaching you uh, it's like these are guys are not, you know, financial model <laughs> or uh, marketers per se. They understand marketing, but you learn design thinking to understand and, by the way, learn about ambiguity, complexity, uh, uh, volatility, forest. Right? So, aren't we missing a lingua franca to be able to shape the future you envision? And where do we find it, if so? Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, maybe saying that we will have a new discipline of design is maybe um, is maybe limiting because I I believe that design is already uh, having so many dis disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in my over, over the last years, I've um, I created a job architecture where it, we introduced 24 disciplines of design and um and then let's they call were it not complete. a domain a new domain of design exactly i mean it's a higher it's a higher uh, it's a higher level right so so from from that point of view i think you are absolutely right we have to we have to get our understanding um, both within design and beyond design. Um, it's very clear that language is sometimes a hinder and not only between designers and non-designers, but also within design. We, we see a huge gap that has been created based on the say the more historically traditional muscle of industrial design and the new 
digital world with companies growing up with hiring designers that only knows the digital sphere. And there are new methodologies being used in that area, which is not that there's, there's no realization that these tools are actually also used in, in industrial design. And we start using the same words for different things and we confuse one another. So, I mean, I breathe, I mean, the first thing that needs to happen is that the digital and the physical world will come together and that we will have a better understanding of the different components. We have to empathize a little bit about the, the, um, the different disciplines that actually exist. And I think the only way to do that is by putting the, the system of humans and society in the center. Because if we if we do that, then we can we can unite around the challenge that we have ahead. I think we've been through over the last decade, especially, a, an expansion of the design disciplines, which has be, made us divided in thinking about applications. So you know you're not anymore a designer, human centric uh, driven but you are a designer of mobile applications, for example. So um, I think that there's a lot of work to be done there in terms of driving it together and creating more of a, uh, of a, a common thread. But on the other hand, as it's so exponential and it's expanding, it will be harder and harder to hold it together. So what I think is more important is that within an industry or within a company that you there have the language that unites you and that actually helps you drive uh, the common the common goal thank you and by the way it just as a side note that's exactly the same problem marketers have with digital marketing now where yeah. basically digital marketing it's becoming this hybrid uh, sales trade marketing and it, very often it generates awareness it's a rapid way to generate awareness, but it doesn't build any brand. Mm, no, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't bring, bring any yeah. emotions to the table, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then be, it gets more difficult. It's easier to brand awareness. It's more cost effective, but then where is the real, uh, uh, you know, brand building effort? So- No, know, but that's very true. That's very yeah. true. Marco? Well, yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, and I would also like uh, to, to have uh, Filiberto jumping with a follow-up uh, question to, to this. Uh, you describe uh, language as a potential obstacle, but uh, one of the things that I happen to do in life is to study linguistics, uh, and uh, language is always based on a kind of uh, formal level, described level, and then on the application and all the little tweaks uh, that make uh, language alive. And beyond the language, there is uh, uh, culture or around the language, there is a culture with an understanding of uh, gestures, uh, of rituals, uh, uh, and that creates the, the um, the environment where the language does its job to in connecting people and uh, enabling uh, communication. Um, you are really focusing on the cultural dimension of organizations and in a way the cultural uh, valorization of uh, what design thinking is and what design is. You mentioned before democratization is uh, a potential um, a potential uh, uh, risk to, to, to go. Uh, I tend to agree with you because I see the democratization of designers, the, the, the responsabilization of the designer, since the designer is only a facilitator and then the direction where the world is going is, is anyway and anywhere. So um, how do you see yourself uh, bringing uh, your design uh, vision and uh, your uh, experience into uh, the cultural uh, domain to design organizations uh, differently, if I express it correctly. 
Yeah, and that might, I think um, I think culture is is um, something to be extremely aware of, and and something to understand, and then you need to break it down, because you can't tackle culture as a whole. Uh, so you have to deconstruct, as designers, we like this deconstructing, right? You have to deconstruct the different elements of culture and then start working on those things that, that can influence it. And so what, what we are looking at is, is focusing on creativity because we believe that creativity is that cognitive muscle that an organization needs Cross different uh, functions and and uh, and disciplines um, when they're working together on these hard uh, questions and and then it is about understanding what is the type of leadership that is needed to, to drive creativity and um, I mean there we are very much in line with um, with um, um, with think. Uh, in, in creative leadership, in, in thinking about it as both a combination of, of transformational and um, servant and authentic uh, leadership traits. So, so that you're really working on, on, on pushing things forward, enabling and empowering teams and setting the right conditions. And then at the same time, you should look at your climate. You know, what is the climate in the organization? What is it on individual level? You know, we know psychological safety and, and, and these aspects, which is extremely important for people to be their true best self. Tricky questions. And here it's so incredibly important to have, in a, we call it intelligent debate and creative tension. And I believe that I am so fortunate as a designer growing up uh, being schooled with some fantastic uh, peers in the industry that has, you know, we were we were always debating and arguing and and um, and building on each other, and um, and that's when you are getting good stuff done. But but you have to have a certain um, safety net and and certain um, environment for that to take place. Um, and then, of course, it matters what the office feels like. And, you know, all offices nowadays, you know, this should look like living rooms. But in fact, you need some knife at the table, you know, where you can carve out things, where you don't have to worry about spilled paint on the uh, on the floor. I like uh, David, uh, I think it was David Kelly was talking about that in one of the podcasts lately. You know, what what is that creatively infusing environment? It might not be like your parents' living room, right? That was uh, what he said at that time. But then, of course, also the the non tangible. What sits in the what sits in the wall of an organization? What are the hero stories? You know, who survives and who doesn't? And um, and that says a lot about the organization and the expectations on the, on the organization. So yeah, multifaceted in the in that sense. And and then thirdly, I would say um, I said. No, actually five things. So uh, thirdly, it is also about the systemization of an organization. You know, what we talked about, you know, what is the strategy? Is it multifaceted? Do you need then a multifaceted um, construction of the organization to be able to em embed and, and work with both innovation and design and design thinking to, to really drive the, the output um, effectively forward? And then, you know, lastly, do the people have the capability that requires to be creative? It is, again, it's a skill that can be taught. Do you have the training that you can actually um, be more aware of what you need to think at a particular time in a process? What is appropriate here and what is appropriate there? Um, because all our brain is, is made for all parts of what's needed in, a, in the innovation process. But certain part of our thinking is better used in some parts than others and how can we actually train the way we think at a given time so that we are um, better moving that value chain forward for for the company we're working for yeah i mean yeah, no, no, I think it's, uh, yeah it's clear it's uh, uh, it's a great approach uh, and i like because it goes back to the 
empathy side to the mindfulness to the structure to the creativity to what is the domain of design but in practical terms with the future of work and you as a leader of electrolux have experienced that uh, where organizations are becoming uh, are adopting an hybrid model of working remotely in the offices is the office in the future whatever but the reality of work is becoming more digital mm. okay so what what are the two three uh key elements that a design leader would need to take in account to make sure you can keep building the culture in the same because the framework is fine but in tangible terms going back to the serendipity you know there are those um coffee table conversations in the office that are so important from a cultural point of view from a getting a feeling of the organization or for the boss to realize you know this guy is struggling is really struggling is not happy or is or is actually boom it's a volcano it's great and maybe he's got too much energy we should use that energy for him in the development of something else so there is an, a lot of intangibles and a lot of serendipity once again in that so how do you work with the changing condition uh, uh, with the hybridization of work to this more qualitative part the blurring mm -hmm. i think uh, you yeah. mentioned it before uh, pernilla the blurring of uh, boundaries which is a yeah, and I, actually i i think <clears throat> i think we are i mean we we would really new to this first of all right we haven't we haven't worked remotely most of us um, for more than two years now right so we haven't yet built up a lot of practice around it and of course we always compare the physical with the digital and and see them as two kind of like separate parts and and then we talk about what we miss from that physical uh, and and making those connections and i believe somewhere that the hybrid will become, I mean, I like the word digiphysical, digi digital, or whatever, how we want to turn the, the words, right? It will become one. And, and I, I believe that it's almost, the, if you think back, I mean, I have teenage kids. They don't see, you know, the, the digital world as a different world. I mean, when we as adults that grew up with, you know, physical play with our friends. If we didn't play with our friends, we were alone, right? And now our kids are growing up, being together with their friends on a digital platform. And they don't, for them, it's seamless. So I believe that there will be a way of, of making the two come together. But I think leaders will have to be much more, um, I would say inquisitive uh, and, and curious. They have to spend time in asking the teams uh, the necessary questions, which is deeper than just, you know, did you manage to deliver this and this, you know, and give time for uh, coffee table discussions, even on a digital format. And then, of course, utilizing any opportunity to be together and, and, and build teams. So, But there is something so powerful that has come out with our learning of working remote is that we are more inclusive. We, we, are, we are able to work beyond time zones and physical distance. We are able to, as individual, be much more whole in the way we live and work. And there are so many benefits from it that I think, you know, in the long run, the, the, the disadvantages will just um, be forgotten because the advantages are so much more powerful. And, and, but then we have to learn to get the nuances um, through meetings, digital meetings, getting to know people. And I find it kind of strange because I, I had met people digitally um, over the last years 
And when I finally met them physical, maybe I'm different, but I actually didn't realize that I met them physically for the first time. Mm. For, for me, it was not such a big boundary. Of course, maybe it was more shocking to them that I was six feet tall and, you know, they hadn't seen me. <laughs> <laughs> the proportions of me so maybe that was that was uh, the funny part of it but in general I felt that it was possible to connect uh, with people and and making sure that you had enough uh, quality time um, but it takes effort mm. I think it takes effort and I agree with you it also takes skills because uh, the managers and leaders need to become less transactional oh, and yeah. more uh, parenting mentoring uh, you know and more working more on the person itself than on the business to be able to deliver the business by the way yeah. <laughs> so, no absolutely and, and and i think this is um th this is where kind of like where the organizational structures are going towards i mean if you look at the the trends of of organizational design i mean you know people will choose work where they can be more autonomous and and you know get value out of who they are rather than you know fitting a fixed job description um we we do know that that um um managers or leaders doesn't necessarily have all the skills that it takes to be able to achieve a transformational task. And then you need to bring people from all different areas together to do that. So you need to kind of like lowering the, um, lowering the, uh, the um, empowerment and the, and the decision, uh, right? And, and more as an organization be guiding on what, what, what is needed and set the parameters of um, focus areas because then people can be much faster in those swim lanes, so to say. So, mm. yeah. Lowering the empowering, you mean uh, bringing uh, the power uh, to a lower, uh, uh, lower, uh, lower organizational functions let's call it yeah well shortening the distance in that sense yeah. right okay. um, i mean it's it's uh, the, the the silo organization uh, you know someone asks a question it needs to go up all the way and yeah. then it needs to go down and instead of them being able to solve it you know where they are and i mean sometimes if there's really tricky and people are stuck you know i mean escalation still needs to be a path to a resolution but um, in, in principle, if you are focused on a goal and you have an outside-in perspective and a view, which is research-based and, and uh, uh, you know, data-informed, why shouldn't the decision be able to be taken there by that team? So you know, it, it, it is about formulating a stronger level of authority and, and, and autonomy in the working team that drives it. And, and not um, anymore on managers that have like the say, because they are informed as much as the team by what's going on with our customers and with our uh, brands and with our markets. So then, then you can create much more of a networked organization that actually can achieve those goals. But you have to be very clear on the direction. You have yeah. to be very clear on, <clears throat> on, on uh, what you want to achieve as a company. I mean, it's... Um, yeah, well, if... Oh, by if, the way, no, to, on a comment on that, which is why purpose for organization is becoming so important because yeah. you need a different type of glue for the organization, especially when the conditions are so volatile and the purpose becomes the beacon. So mm -hmm. people know where they need to you know, go without being reminded or by the boss of the boss of the boss all the time. Mm. But I would say that both purpose and vision are important because the purpose is really, it's really framing on, on your being and, and why you are in, in business. And it can be very, you know, inspiring and, and very, um, um, let's say, broad in terms of it setting yourself up in a certain context. But you need to combine that with a vision because a vision really gives you a direction. Like, okay, we have this purpose, 
So we know why we are in business. And now we have a, a vision which will guide us uh, towards what we want to become in the future. So if we have both those two components, I think we are uh, in a really good stage. Thank you, Marco. Well, uh, I would like to conclude with a bit of a different question because if I listen to your uh, vision of uh, designing organizations and uh, injecting creativity into cultures and steering differently, I think uh, that it's uh, it's um, the underlying theme uh, is a big uh, uh, switch, a big shift from uh, command and control to mentoring uh, and nurturing. Mm. And in this sense, uh, uh, without uh, getting into gender theory or feminist uh, theory necessarily, but I see a shift uh, towards uh, um, a, a female future. Uh, in there is an Italian expression that uh, that goes like, uh, uh, "The future uh, is uh, bright. The future is uh, female." Well, I think uh, from a gender perspective, you are definitely uh, a, a very successful uh, uh, business leader. Uh, but uh, what do you think is the interplay between uh, the, the the sort of uh, uh, tension or divide between uh, different models, uh, social models, uh, intellectual models, where female values come uh, into play uh, as uh, uh, drivers for new leadership, for the leadership of the future? And how can design uh, contribute to uh, to preferable futures in this in that sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I I'm a big fan of um, now. I'm going to refer to a book. Uh, I'm a big fan of Heat Hofstede's uh, cultures and organizations uh, that has quite a few years on its uh, neck. Um, I'd love to see a new version of that. Unfortunately, he has um, he has passed. Right. Um, but he's working on many dimensions, and one of them is femininity and masculinity. And um, I, I read this one many, many years back, and, and it resonated with me because I do think that masculinity and femininity is something that we all have, regardless if we are men or women. And, um, and there are many other dimensions as well, which of course needs to be taken in consideration. Um, growing up as a, as a leader um, during the um, 90s and, you know, 2000, um, I didn't have a lot of uh, female role models um, around me. Um, I, I did, though, found a lot of male role models that had feminine traits in their leadership. And I started kind of like figuring out my own path um, based on that, kind of like realizing <clears throat> what it would mean for me, but pioneering a little bit in, in, this, uh, in this field, in this area. And, and that's why I'm so adamant nowadays also to support um, young females uh, in, in their journey, because I believe that the the opportunities for women uh, today is completely different from how it was when, when I grew up or even those women before me grew up, right? And uh, there is something very beautiful in the exponential curve that, that we as designers believe in a lot, right? It's, uh, it's um, nothing ever, ever static, everything can always be improved. And there I think designers can contribute with an optimistic mindset, which is more than anything. And because we are not designing for ourselves, we're designing for others, and we need to go through this deep empathy, you know, realizing empathy into a stage of compassion. It is about building these um, muscles and, and listening for actions and support and guidance. And, uh, and I, I believe that that is in the nature of what we do, actually, and, and that will help us regardless of what gender we have. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Filiberto, do you have some final remarks to share with uh, Pernille? No, with the... I have uh, uh, nothing but a big thanks uh, to Pernilla for the time and for the chat. Uh, I think this is uh, a lot of... Uh, 
uh, interesting uh, leads and wisdom to the past, uh, in the present, and for the future. Uh, and you know, I can just hope we can be uh, all more empathic uh, in that sense, and men be in touch with our feminine side to be able to build uh, better, more inclusive organizations. Because more inclusive organizations are more powerful, uh, more just, uh, and better performing. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, <laughs> by all means and purposes. I have to, I have to add one here, uh, because everyone talks about diversity today and the importance of that. And we are nowhere with diversity if we not build inclusivity into that um, equation. Well, diversity is very, uh, is very easy when it does not challenge uh, the structures of power. So, uh, exactly. uh, you know, you can be, you can welcome a diverse army if you stay the general and exactly. uh, you make all decisions, but that's not diversity. That's uh, just a way to reiterate the same structures. And I think uh, uh, change will come. Uh, your daughters will uh, bring a change uh, at uh, structural levels, like all the new generations and for sure, they will be very much inspired by uh, your work and your uh, uh, journey. Well, thank you very much, uh, Pernilla, for uh, sharing your thoughts about uh, the future of design and design thinking, and ultimately about uh, the, the future of uh, the rest of us. Uh, thank you, Filiberto, also for uh, co-hosting with me, like always. And we will surely be uh, uh, connected and uh, stay connected uh, uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Bernilla. Thank you. Thank much. you for having me.